So welcome to this WiseAL tutorial on using either NumPy or NumP, depending on which way you pronounce it, within Python. Here's what you'll learn during the tutorial. So we'll begin with an introduction to NumPy or NumP, and in that I'll talk about the pronunciation of it as well, and I'll also introduce the concept of arrays. We'll then go on to look at how you can start to use NumPy or NumP. I really should decide which I'm going to call it. And then we'll look at how you can assign a data type when you're creating an array and what the choices are. We'll look at various different ways in which you can create arrays within NumPy or NumP. There I go again. How you can slice arrays to extract just rows or columns or block of data you want. How you can aggregate along an axis using either mean or max or min or sum. How you can multiply arrays together. And there's two different ways to do that, and I'll explain the differences between them. And then we'll do a practical example of multiplication using Premier League football data, as it happens. We'll then go on to look at how you can sort arrays, how you can join arrays together. Again, two different ways to do that too. And finally, I'll look at a whole raft of other array techniques you can use to do things like transposing arrays or filtering them, or many other things besides. At the top right of the screen, you'll be able to click on a link which should appear about now. And that will give you access to any files or exercises to do with this tutorial. But that's enough for me. I'm going to vanish. And Sven will guide you through, as ever, the rest of the tutorial. So let's get started. So before we begin looking at what NumPy is or NumP is, let's look at one of the most controversial topics, which is how you pronounce the name of the module. There's two schools of thought. Americans will probably be inclined to pronounce it NumPy. It is, after all, called Python. Europeans, particularly perhaps those wretched Brits, tend to pronounce it NumP to rhyme with lumpy. I can see merit in both approaches. I probably already pronounced it in two different ways and will continue to be inconsistent, but I'm leaning towards NumPy because most of the modules have a pie sound in them. But let's get on to more important things. The example we're going to be doing during this tutorial will be primarily around the Premier League, which is English football, basically. Um, hopefully people are familiar with this around the world, uh, although you don't particularly need to be. So this is the results at the end of the 2020-21 season, and these are the results at the end of the 2019-20 season. And by a happy coincidence, the same five teams finished in the top five positions, which means we can create arrays pretending that these are the only teams in the league, and then we can manipulate them to show exciting results. So I want to look now at how you can specify arrays, dimensions, shapes, data types, and axes, some of the main uh, terms that NumPy, or NumPy, there I go again, uses. So we might create an array to hold the list of football team names. And in that case, you would be creating an array with a single dimension. The data type would be string, although actually it would be angle brackets U14, but that's another story coming up later. And the shape would be five. The comma after the five is to signify that this is an array, but it's only got one dimension. And this array would have a single axis, which is numbered zero. You notice the inconsistency. Axes are numbered from zero, but some of the other things are numbered from one. Or you could create another array to hold the actual data. How many gains were won, drawn, lost? Goals for or against and difference. In this case, this would have two dimensions. The data type would be integer, although again, it would actually be probably be int32. And the shape would be five by eight. And the axes, the first axis would be going down, and the second axis, number one, would be going across. What you couldn't do is combine the two arrays together. One of the main um, uh, symptoms, and that's the wrong word, one of the main things you can notice about an array in NumPy is that it can only have a single data type within it, so you can't mix data types. And that's to allow them to work more quickly. You can have arrays with more than two dimensions in if you want. So this is an array which takes at the top the 2020-21 results, at the bottom it takes the 2019-20 results, and it combines them together into a single array. And this array would have three dimensions. The data type would probably be integer or some variant of that, and the shape would be 2 by 5 by 7. And there's nothing to stop you having 4, 5, 6, n dimensions, although you'll find it very difficult to represent on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. So let's look at some advantages of num, 
Pi, I still can't decide. Uh, one of the advantages is it's quick. It's written in another language, probably C Sharp, I think, and compiled. So unlike some of the other modules, it should run very quickly. The second advantage is there's loads of built-in functions for doing things like transposing arrays and multiplying them together, and many other things besides, many of which we'll look at during this tutorial. And a third advantage is it's used as a basis for other modules, such as, for example, Pandas. Now, you shouldn't worry necessarily too much about this. For example, if you're learning Pandas, you can perfectly well use it without really understanding many of the things I'm going to tell you in this NumPy tutorial. So you might like to consider that when you're scratching or tearing your hair out trying to understand some of the more complicated examples we're going to come to. So in order to be able to look at NumPy, you need to import the module. So I can type in import the name of the module, NumPy, as, and universally it's called NP. You don't have to give it an alias like that, but everybody does. Now you'll notice it doesn't recognize NumPy, and that's because I haven't yet imported it, or rather installed it. Or if I have, I've then uninstalled it. So what I need to do is open up a new copy of a terminal window, as I've just done there and type pip space install space numpy. And I do apologize to American viewers, I seem to be standardizing on calling it numpy. If I press return then, um, you can see it's installing uh, numpy and that's finished. And the underlining and the error message has gone away from that. So that's good, that means I'll be able to create arrays. But before I do that, I just want to show you the difference between a numpy array and a normal list. So I begin in a rather strange place by creating a single variable. So what I'm going to do is create a variable called Spice Boy. We'll have some Spice Girls soon. And I'll set that to be my own name, Sven. So that's a single variable. You can combine variables to create lists or tuples, which are called sequences in general. So for example, I might have a, a variable called Spice Girls. Spice Girls list, because that's what it's going to be. And what that would do is, so I've got slightly too many square brackets there, that could contain a list of all the different Spice Girls. And then I could print it out. And I don't think I'm telling you anything you didn't know already. So I'll just print out that list. And if I run that, you can see it gives me the list I've just typed in. But the critical thing about this is you can put anything you like into a list, including Strings of text, numbers, dates, other lists, tuples. So just to prove this, let's add a ridiculous tuple one, two, and three. It doesn't belong in the list, but when I run the program, you can see I get the elements I've added to it. So there's no concept of a list having the same data type for each element. And that's where arrays differ. So finally, what I'm going to do is create an array of Spice Girls. So they deserve to be capitalized. So to do this, I can create a new variable. Just like lists and tuples, uh, arrays are held in variables. I can take my NumPy module, which I've chosen to refer to as MP instead. And then I can create an array based on that. Type in an open bracket because this is a function which needs to take an argument. And the argument it takes, the main one, is a sequence of objects. So I've created a list there. And what I could then do is print out some information about this. So what I'll do is print out. Firstly, I would like to know what uh, shape this array I've created is. I've talked a bit about shape already. Secondly, I would like to know what data type each of the elements contains. And finally, what I'm going to do is print out the array itself. And I'll just comment out that line so that doesn't interfere with anything. So if I run this program you can see that I will get the shape of it, a single dimension with five elements in. The data type, I did say it was going to be weird, it's called angle brackets u6 because what it does is look at all the entries, works out the longest one is six characters long, I think Ginger and Sporty share that distinction, and allocates six characters to each of the elements. When you create an array, it will always use the, it will look down the list of objects to be stored in it and always allocate the amount of bytes stored by the most memory intensive element. 
So in this case, it's not just using six characters to store the sporty and ginger, but also to store posh, scary and baby too. So that's something to think about when you're creating an array. And the third thing it does is it prints out the array itself. And you can see it's an array because there's no commas between the elements in it. Otherwise, it would have been a list. So that's a basic array. Let's create another one now. Let's create our Premier League array. To do this, I'm going to create a variable called prem table, and I'm going to set it to be something. So I'll create another array, mp.array, and put some brackets in. And then within the brackets, I'm going to specify that I want to start a list there. My list there. So this array is going to be two-dimensional, so it'll have a list of lists. And if I go to my clipboard, I'm hoping I will find what I'm looking for there. So that array contains um, the team number, the number of games they won, drew and lost, how many goals they scored for, how many goals they scored against, and the total number of points won. Although there's nothing telling of that, it's up to you to remember that information. So what I could do again is to print that information out, but I'm going to cheat slightly and copy these lines from above. And what I'll do is select the word Spice Girls and type in instead a prem table. I could probably do this more efficiently, but nothing springs to mind because I want to avoid editing every occurrence of it. And if I run this program, having commented out my information on the Spice Girls, you can see that it will give me the information I wanted. The shape of this array is a five by seven. So it's five rows and seven columns. Although in many ways, think of these as, a, as um, rows and columns can be a mistake with arrays. They're really more just axes. The data type is in 32. So that's good. It means every single number I'm storing will fit into an in 32 variable. There's no need to use int 64 for any of these. None of the numbers are so big. And then it prints out the array itself. And that's a visual representation of a two-dimensional array. So that's how you create arrays in NumPy. I just wanted to say a quick word about data types. I've created a file called b-datatypes.py and copied or pasted rather my Premier League table array into that. And if I just print that out, you will see that it gives me my array. Now, when you're creating an array like this, you've got the choice of a second argument. So if I just manage to position my mouse pointer between there, just before the end of the function call, type a comma in, you can see it comes up with the IntelliSense, and you can see the second argument is specifying what the data type should be. So you can use this either as a positional or a named argument. So I could either type D type equals or just put the data type in. And what I'm going to do is type in np.int64. And that means it's a larger integer, more than the different data types in a second. So when I run that, you can see that it should work. But just to prove what's going on, I'm also going to print out the array's data type as well. And I think we'll have a blank line between them as a bit of a treat. So if I now run that program, you can see it gives me the data type, which is now changed in 64 from what it would be by default in 32 and the array itself. So what would happen if you tried putting in a data type which wasn't wholly compatible? Well, it would still probably work. So I'm going to use bool8, which is a boolean in NumPy. Again, more on this in a second. And if I run that, you'll see I get an array of trues. Because unless any of these values is zero, then it will be treated as true. There's one exception there, as you can see. And sure enough, it shows up as a false in my array. So what are the different data types that you can use? Well, there's a file included within this tutorial called datatypes.png. And if you go to that, you can see a summary of them. So uh, I've only included integer, floating point and boolean because I can't see why you'd ever have an array of strings, um, but you can. And you can see uh, the main ones, data types you can use in this column. Now that's not the full story. That's just the simplification of it. So if you want the full story in the useful links.txt file, I've included a link to the full McCoy, if you like. And if you go to that, you can see on the NumPy website, a full list of how the different aliases work and what they actually mean underneath the scenes. But I think by this stage, I've told you way more than 
you probably need to know to use NumPy. So I think it's time to move on to something else. So we're going to look now at ways in which you can create arrays in NumPy. There's, there's many of them. So we'll look at using a range to act as the equivalent of the normal range function, which will generate a sequence of numbers. We'll look at using lin space to fill up a space with a given number of data points, so from the start point to an end point. We'll look at generating empty arrays, and then we'll look at generating arrays of zeros and ones, which isn't quite the same thing as we'll see. We'll look at generating arrays of random numbers, a couple of ways of doing that out of the many available, and we'll look at filling arrays from sequences or iterations. So to get us started, I've created a file called C Ways to Create Arrays, and I've imported the NumPy namespace and renamed it as MP. So the first thing we're going to do is look at A range, and A range is the equivalent, if I could spell that, of the range function. It works in exactly the same way. So what I'll do is create uh, an array called test array, and I'll set it equal to np dot arrange. Now, whenever I type this in, I type in arrange, and I'm astonished to find it doesn't exist in IntelliSense, and that's because it should be a range. And I guess it's the array equivalent of just a range um, function. And you can see that the arguments are um, the start, the stop, and the step value. So this is exactly the same as range. So for example, I could create a, an array going from one up to, but not including 11, uh, with a step value of two. And when I print this out, which I will do now, then what it will do is show me what I've got. So if I just, just print that out, and you can see it gives me one, three, five, seven, nine. So exactly the same as range. So the next thing we're going to do is look at the um, lin space, which fills array, well actually it fills um, a range would be a better way of describing it. So I'm going to keep creating the same variable. This is grossly inefficient because it will mean when I run the program it keeps creating lots of different versions of the same, or lots of different arrays and puts them in the same variable, but it saves me having to comment things out. So to do this I can use lin space. What I'm going to do is start at the number one and I'm going to go on to the number ten. But in between that, I want to create, I'm going to choose this number at random, seven data points. So now when I print this out, you can see it creates seven data points. One, 2.5, four, 5.5, seven, 8.5, and 10. And LinSpace will always generate floating point numbers um, because it has to, to fill in the gaps. So moving swiftly on, that's a, the third thing we were going to do is generate an empty array. To do that, I'll create my trusty variable again, and I'll set it equal to empty. And the argument to the empty function, as for so many array ones, is a shape. So in this, I can specify in brackets any shape I like. I'm going to go for two by three, let's say. And if I run that program, you can see it generates a fairly strange looking array. So the idea behind this is it will create a space in memory ready for use but it won't initialize any of the values. So if it's not initializing any of the values, if it's saving time, why on earth has it got values in them? And the answer to that is it's displaying whatever was left in memory. So the base is commandeered a bit of your memory in your computer, and whatever was there already, it's just showing those values as if they were numbers. So the MT uh, function has the advantage it's much, much quicker than creating an array full of zeros, for example, because if you do the latter, you have to actually populate or initialize all the values. So that's an empty array. Let's do some zeros and ones, which none of which will surprise anyone. So to do this, I can put mp.zeros. And what I'll do again is specify the shape of it. So list, this time, let's have a single dimension. Let's have 10 comma. The comma is to signify that this is just one dimension. And if I run that, you can see it gives me an array of 10 zeros. There's nothing very exciting about that. And I'm afraid that the ones is going to be equally unexciting. It's just going to have ones instead of zeros. But let's have a, a second dimension to it, a second axis rather. And if I run that, you'll see my second array just contains ones. So I presume the main use of these is working with things like determinants with matrices. Um, that's all I can think of anyway. Moving swiftly on. 
So let's now create some random numbers. And to do that, we'll use our trusty variable to create an array. Type mp.random. And when you type the dot after that, you can see some idea of just how many random number functions there are. We're going to use two, which will cover most eventualities, I think, which are rand and randint. So let's start with rand. This is an odd function because it's not obvious from the IntelliSense what the arguments should be. But all you do is specify the shape, but not included in brackets. So let's say I want something like 2 by 7. Um, when I run that, you'll see it generates an array of random numbers. And uh, the random numbers are between 0 and 1. That's what's returned by default with the rand function. If you want integers by contrast, then what you can do is use the randint function. So random.randint. And you can specify three arguments. The first one is where you want to start. Let's say the lowest number is 1. The second one is where you want to stop, or actually just before where you want to stop. So we'll, we'll have 10 as the highest integer. And the third one is a shape. And we haven't had many three-dimensional arrays. I think it's time to rectify that. Let's have 3 by 4 by 5. And if I run that, you'll see I get a fairly large array, 3 by 4 by 5. Hopefully you'll agree with me about that. Containing random numbers between 1, well, it's actually between 0 and 11. So starting at 1, but not including the endpoint 11. So that's random numbers. And then the last thing I was going to do in this comprehensive section on the different ways in which you can generate arrays is to generate uh, an array from a sequence. And to do that, I need a sequence. So what I'm going to do is create one called the trusty squares. What I'll do is use a list comprehension to generate a list of the squares. So I'll take n times n for n in range, and I'll go from 1 up to, but not including, 11. So that'll be the first 10 squares. If you've no idea what that is, it's a list comprehension. It's an excellent tutorial. Go back to it and watch it. Well worth watching. So what I can now do is uh, set my variable called test array equal to mp dot. And then I can use the built-in mathematical function from it. Well, that's what I thought it was. It actually stands for from iteration. It took me a worryingly long time to realize that. So what I'll do is type in an open brackets. And then all I need to specify, you would think, was the um, iterable object, the sequence in this case. And you'd think that would be enough. But when I run it, I'll actually get an error message because it's missing a retired argument, the data type. Quite why it needs a data type, I'm not sure. It already knows these are integers, but hey, who am I to argue? So I'll tell it it's using int32 data. And now if I run that again, you should see I get a list of all the squares as an array. So you can't argue, you can't say that there's not lots of ways of creating arrays using NumPy. So we're going to look at how you can slice arrays now. And we'll start with a quick bit of revision of how you can slice sequences, because this is exactly the same principle. So if you have a sequence, you can specify up to three arguments, or three parts, I guess I should say. They're not strictly speaking arguments. The first part is where you want to start in your sequence. The second optional part is one before the end position, so it will run up to but not including that point. And the third optional part is how many items you want to skip each time. So you can specify one, two or three of those parts. And that's how it works for a sequence. Now the difference with an array is it's even possibly more complicated because what you can do for an array is have an additional argument after here with how you want to treat the second and then the third, and then the fourth ac axis in the array. So you can slice each axis of the array independently using exactly the same syntax. So let's see how this works in practice. So I've created a file called dsliceArrays.py, and I've imported my NumPy mo module, and I've created a Premier Table array. What I'm going to do is three or four examples of how you can slice this. So I'll start with printing the first three teams. So I'll put a headline into that effect with a line break before it, just to make it easier to read. And then I'm going to print out the Premier League table, but not all the Premier League table. I'll put a square bracket in to show that I want to slice this. And I'm going to start at the beginning. So I'll start at zero. And I'll stop just before the fourth row. 
And the fourth row, because they're numbered from zero, is denoted as number three. But as I explained in my section on sequence slicing, the best thing to do is take the difference between those two numbers. Three minus zero is three, so I'll get three rows out. I don't actually need to put the zero in. It's a default anyway. It will by default start with um, at the beginning. If I try running that now, you'll see I should get the first three teams. I didn't specify any slicing for my horizontal, my second axis, and so I would assume I want everything in that. So let's try another example. This time, let's print out uh, let's all the key info. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, just after typing in a comment. So what do I mean by key info? Well, I don't want the first column because that just contains a team number. That's nothing to do with how the teams did. And I don't want the last column giving the um, points because I can infer that from how many games they won, drew and lost. I can calculate that myself. So I'll miss out the first and last columns. So to do that, I'll take the premier table. I need to be careful that I'm working with a second axis of the array. So I'm going to put a colon in. <clears throat> and what that colon will mean is start at the beginning and end at the end for the first uh, axis. So I'll get all of the rows, but I'll only get some of the columns. In fact, I will start with the f second row and I'll stop just before the end. And if this all seems very unfamiliar to you, have a quick look back at the section on slicing and sequences, which goes into more detail. I've got an error message because I included an extra square brackets for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. So if I try running that, you'll see it gives me the key info. So it's missed out the first column and the last column. And I could, of course, combine this. So I could print out um, the key info for first three teams. And this would just be a combination of what I did above. So I'll print out the Premier League table. Then I will start at the beginning, but stop just before the fourth row for the first axis of the dimension. And then for the second one, I will start at the second column and I will stop just before the end. Quite, quite a dense syntax. You have to have a very clear head about it. And if I run that, you'll see I should get the first three teams and just the key information. If your mind already isn't blown by this, let's create a chessboard effect just for fun. So what I'm going to do is essentially print out every other row and every other column. So I think the values I'll get, and it might be better to circle some of them, um, I will get that value, then that value, then that, then that. Then I'll miss out the next row and go on to that, and that, and that, and so on down, and I'll get a chessboard type effect. I'm not quite sure why you'd ever want to do this, but it will teach you a bit about slicing. So the last thing I'm going to print out is um, alternate rows and columns. So to do this, I'm going to print out my Premier League table. Type in square brackets. So for the first uh, axis, which are the rows, I want everything. So I put colon, colon. That means start at the beginning and go on to the end. And the third bit of information I specify is the step value. So I'm going to go to every second row. And then I can do the same thing with the columns. So I can say start at the beginning and go on to the end, but include every second column. And if I run this, and I might just comment out the rest of it to make it easier to read, you can see I get every alternate row and column. And a quick glance suggests it has actually done, I think, what I wanted to do. Yeah, it looks convincing to me. So what we're going to do now is something which is like row totals or column totals, but probably more powerful than either of those two. Partly because it allows you to not only sum information, but also take the average, the max and the min. Those are the four functions supported for this. And also because you can combine it with slicing to get exactly what you want. So let's have a look at an example. This, the fifth figure in each row gives the number of goals scored and the sixth figure gives the number of goals against. And what I'd like to do is show the total number of goals scored and the total number of goals against. So I want to basically sum down this column and this column. 
To do that, I can create an, a new array which contains just those figures and some that. But I can do all of this in a single go, actually. So I'm going to print out the Premier League table. I'm going to slice it. Uh, so I'm going to take all of the rows. But for the columns, I'll begin uh, three columns before the end, and I'll stop just before the end. So that will pick out um, the two columns I want. And then I can either sum, max, mean, or min this. I'm going to sum it. And when you sum something, by default, it collapses it down to a single value, as we'll see. So if I run that, you'll see it gives me the number 554, which is actually the sum of all the goals scored for and all the goals scored against, which is completely meaningless. So what I need to do instead is sum uh, down uh, the first axis of my array. So to do that, you can specify in brackets the axis you're summing down. So if I put zero, then I'll get the figures I wanted. There were 350 goals scored for and 204 against. Had I instead put in the number one, it would sum across the columns and give me for each row the total value of all the figures in that row, except it wouldn't, it would just be those two figures. So that's why it says 115 for the first team. And had I put in a different number, like two, I imagine I'm going to get an error because there's only two axes in the um, array. So I'll just return that back to zero. So that's how you can sum or average or take the max or mean uh, for an axis. Um, this actually generates an array itself. So I could call this something like goals. And there's nothing to stop me repeat this to sum the goals. So I could print out goals.sum and I could sum that. But because that's only a single axis shape, there's no point putting an axis in brackets. And if I run that, I'll get a single figure, which is a total number of goals scored. So that's how you can work with aggregating data. What we'll do is look now at how you can do matrix-like operations on arrays. What I want to show now is the difference between two types of multiplication of arrays in NumPy. One uses cell-by-cell -cell multiplication using the Python multiply keyword or function, and the other uses matrix multiplication using the Python dot keyword. In my humble opinion, they've got the two words the wrong way around, but we'll come to that later maybe. So I've got in Excel two arrays, each containing fairly random numbers, and I want to multiply them together. Hopefully viewers know enough Excel to be able to follow along with this. It's going to be pretty basic stuff. So for the cell by cell multiplication, I could take the top left cell of the first array and multiply by the top left cell of the second to get eight. And what I could then do is copy and paste that into the other cells to get the other figures. So for example, if I look at this one, that's taking the top right cell of the first array times the top right cell of the second. It's doing cell by cell multiplication, sometimes called scalar multiplication. For the matrix multiplication, it's more difficult. What I want to do is treat these two arrays as matrices. Now, if you've never used a matrix in mathematics, you may slightly struggle with numpy arrays, but I'll have a go at explaining it. So I'm going to use the uh, Excel mmult function, which takes two arrays. That's the first one. And that's the second. And when I press return, you'll see it fills in the matrix for me. Where are these numbers coming from? Well, let's start with the number 26 there. What that is, is that block of cells there times that block of cells there. You, you do it in order, so 2 times 4 plus 3 times 6 gives 26. This one is this block of cells there times that block of cells there. 2 times 7 plus 3 times 0 is 14. The 34 there comes from the second row times the first column. 1 times 4 plus 5 times 6 is 34. And finally, the bottom one is the second row times the second column, which is 1 times 7 plus 5 times 0, which gives 7. That's what matrix multiplication is. If you've never seen it before, maybe you need to go and brush up on your matrices in maths. I don't know. So let's now see how that works in Python. I'll just transfer to that. And I've created a function, or rather a program, called f.versusmultiply.py. 
and I've included the two matrices exactly the same as I had in Excel, and I'm printing them out. So when I run that, you can see it gives me the two matrices. So let's try doing the two uh, multiplications in order. Firstly, we'll do a cell by cell multiplication. So to do that, what I'm going to do is create a variable called answer. Let's call it answer one imaginatively. And what this will do is take the numpy module and multiply first matrix second. What I'll then do is print that out. Carriage return before that. So by function, and then I'll print out answer one. If I run that program, you'll see it gives me the left hand of the two matrices I created in Excel. The other way I can do it is I can use matrix multiplication. To do this, I'll create another variable called answer two, and I'll set this to be the first matrix. and dot the second. That's a rather surprising way, I think, in which you create um, matrix multi multiplication in NumPy. I'll print out a heading and also a little mistake because it's annoying me, probably annoying you as well. And then I'll print out the second matrix, which is answer two. So if I run this, you'll see my second matrix is the result of multiplying one matrix by the other. So that's the difference between multiply and dot. What we're now going to do is a practical example with the Premier League data. And in that, I'll show you that when you multiply two matrices together, they have to be compatible. Otherwise, you get something called a broadcasting error. I've got a file called Premier League points.xlsx, which is a workbook I just showed you. And I'll right click on that and choose to open it in preview because I've installed the Excel preview extension in a previous tutorial. If you haven't got that installed, it actually looks much better in Excel anyway, if you have that on your machine. And what I want to do is I want to multiply the games played times the points per game. So I'll highlight the games played. It's this block of cells, giving the one games one drawn and lost. And the points is this block of cells over here. So that's what I want to multiply together. So what I'll do firstly is to create an array referring to the games played and then I'll multiply the two together, firstly using matrix multiplication and explaining how that's working, and secondly using cell-by-cell -cell, um, multiplication. So let's start that. I've created a file called gpremierleaguepoints.py, and what that does is create the two basic arrays, one of the Premier League table and one of the actual points scored per game. What I'm going to do to make life easier is create a subset of the table giving games played. Otherwise, I'm going to have to keep slicing it to get the right information. So I'll call this played, and I'll set it equal to the Premier League table. And then to slice it, for the first index, I need to take absolutely everything. And for the so first axis, rather. And for the second axis, I need to start at the second column and go on to include three columns. Just check I've got that right by printing it out. Such confidence from your trainer. And if I print that out, you'll see it gives me the information I want. Games uh, won, games drawn, and games lost. So now I can multiply those two together. First thing I'm going to do is use dot, which is matrix multiplication. I really do think they've got the names of these functions the wrong way around. That should be called multiply, but never mind. So to do this, I'll create a variable called answer1, same convention as before. And what that will do is uh, take the first matrix, which is the played figures, and multiply it by the second, which is the points. And what I could then do is print out that answer to see if it's actually worked. And if I run that, you can see I've got exactly what I wanted. So how did that actually work? Or more to the point, why did it work? Let's go back to our Excel workbook and have a look at the dot spreadsheet. 
So this contains the two matrices I'm uh, multiplying together. And at this point, I'm going to teach you what I learned in, I think, O-level or A-level maths, I can't remember. There's, those exams don't even exist anymore. So I've got two things I'm multiplying together. The first one is 4 by 3, and the second one is 3 by 1. And the rule I was always taught is that you can do this providing that the inner pair of indices here are the same. So providing that the columns in the first matrix are the same as the rows in the second. And if they are the same, the dimensions of the final matrix will be the outer pair, 4 times 1. So that's why this is working. Now, if you reversed it and you said 3 times 1 by 4 times 3, then the inner pair would not be the same and it wouldn't actually work. So what I can do is test out my theory, my, my school maths, and see if I reversed it, whether that will work. So what I'll just do, I need to remember to undo this, is take points dot played, and these aren't compatible. And what I'll get when I run this is a broadcasting error. The shapes aren't compatible, they don't align. So matrix multiplication is subject to a restriction. Okay, now let's do the same thing using uh, normal multiplication. So actually I'll call it cell by cell multiplication. To do this, um, I'll create a variable called answer2. And the first thing I'll do is set it equal to mp.multiply. And I'll take my first matrix, which is the games played, and multiply it by the points. And then I'll print out that second matrix, or second array, and I'll just comment out that one. So if I run that, you'll see it gives me half of an answer. What it's actually doing is this. If I go back to my uh, workbook and click on the multiply worksheet, what it's doing is taking 27 times 3 plus 5 times 1 plus 6 times 0. And then when it gets to the second row, it realizes it's run out of numbers. So it just repeats itself and uses this same row again. So the second row is 21 times 3 plus 11 times 1 plus 6 times 0. It's a bit deceptive because it looks like it's doing the same as the dot multiplier. So if I run that one more time, just to show you what the answer looked like, what I want to do to get my final points is I want to sum across each row, which is a second axis. So I can do that using the aggregation I showed earlier. So I'll create a, a final answer, final final answer uh, variable, and that will hold the answer. What I'll do is sum it down the second axis. So going across the rows, and when I print that out, I hope you'll see we get the same thing as we got from the matrix multiplication. Just coming this out for the sake of completeness to give you exactly the same thing. So this doesn't claim to be a complete guide to sorting arrays by any stretch of the imagination. And I also wonder why you, why you should want to do it. In general, you work with arrays and you're not too bothered about the order in which things come. But with those two qualifications aside, let's look at how you can sort arrays. Let's look firstly at what the obvious method would do and show that it probably doesn't give the obvious answer. So what I'll do is sort this array without any qualifications whatsoever. I'll call it New Order, named after the 1980s group, I think. And we'll say mp.sort, and we'll put the Premier League table into the array. And let's see what we get as a result. So when you run that, you'll see you get every single row has been sorted into ascending order. So taking the first row there, you can see the values of the first row have been sorted into ascending order. But they've all been done independently, and hence it's basically shuffled all your data. It's highly unlikely to be what you want to happen. When you're specifying sort like this, you can uh, put an additional second argument which says which axis you're sorting over. And it defaults, as it says here, to the last axis. So if I were to put one in, I would get exactly the same result because that's the last axis. But if I were to change my mind and put zero in instead, then I'd sort it by the first axis. And this time each column has been sorted. So for the team ID has been sorted, the goals, sorry, the games one has been sorted and so on. And basically, again, the information has been shuffled. So that's one way to sort an array. How do you do what you probably want to do, 
which is to sort them. For example, I think we'll sort them according to how many uh, games were drawn. So you'd expect this to be the first one in the list because they drew five games. Then you'd expect this to be the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Now, this is harder to do than you might think and involves using the argsort function and building up a single column of sort orders. So let's try doing this. Firstly, I'll create a column of this, what's called the sort indices. And I'll call it sort indices because that's a good descriptive name. And I'll take the numpy module use the argsort, argsort function. And what I want to do within this is sort it by this column. That's uh, the second axis and it's the second column. So to do that, I can put the Premier League table in and then I can slice it. I'll take all of the values on the first, all the rows basically, and I will take the second column, which is column number two. And to see what's going on here, let's have an intermediate step printing that out. What you'll get, as you can see, is the values 0, 4, 2, 3, 1. And the reason you get that is this. You're sorting by this column. The first item in the list, number five, is from the zeroth row. Second item, number six, is from the fourth row because rows are number from zero. The third item, uh, number nine, is from the what is the second row, and so on. So that's where we get zero, four, two, three, one. You can then use this to incorporate it into final sorting. Okay, so what I'll do is create a new variable. Let's call it final table. And I'll set that equal to the Premier League table I had originally. And then the rather unusual thing you do is specify for each row which sort order you want to use for it. It doesn't actually bear too much thinking about, but it does work. So what I could then do is print out the final table. And in order to be able to compare it, sorry about that, in order to be able to compare it to the original one, what I'm going to do is just print out the original table up here and then comment out some intermediate line of code. Okay, so let's see this in action. If I run that program, you can see that the original table here is in a different order to the final table here. So I'm going to choose, uh, let's choose team three at random. You can see when I select that, that it's identical in both the top and the bottom table. So it hasn't been scrambled as happened with the previous sorting, but the order has been changed. And the critical thing is if you now look um, at the bottom table at the column I wanted to sort by, which is this one, you can see it's successfully sorted it by that column. Whether it's worth it is another question altogether. What we're going to do now then is to join two arrays together. I've created a file called i-joinarrays.py and created two arrays, one our familiar 2020-21 Premier League table, and the other one the same thing, but for the previous year. And I might well want to join them together. So there's two ways in which I can logically do that, I would have thought. One way is I could create a third dimension. The first element in that third dimension would be the first table, and the second one would be the second table. Or the other way I could do it is I could keep the number of dimensions the same, uh, and I could just add things to one of the two axes. And this could work in one of two ways. So I could either take the first table and add the second table onto the right of it, or the other obvious way to do it is I could take the first table and add the second table just underneath it, which is more likely to be what I want because then it would end up with one set of teams and then another set of teams. So those are the various permutations. Let's do them in that order. So the first thing I'll do is create uh, another dimension, if only it was that easy. So to do this, I'm going to create a new variable, let's call it combined, and I will take the MP uh, module, and I'll use the stack method. And you need to be very careful when you're doing this to get your arguments right. 
it's saying that it wants a sequence of array-like objects as the first argument. So the obvious temptation is would be wrong. The obvious temptation being to put the tables like that as two separate arguments. If you do that, it will think that's the sequence of tables you're joining together and treat that as a second argument and run into problems. So what I need to do is make sure I'm providing this as a sequence. So I'll include that in square brackets to make it a list of a list of lists, basically, or a list of arrays. The second argument then is which access I want to create. Um, you can see here it says uh, you can do it by the first dimension or the last dimension. Um, I'm not sure what the default is, does it say? I want in any case to do it by the first dimension and you'll see the results. So I'll put zero in. If I now print that combined array out, you'll see what I've done. It contains all the information I wanted um, in an extra dimension. So I've got a new axis. This is zeroth element in the axis, and this is the first element in the axis. And that might be a convenient way to combine the two uh, arrays together. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, if I comment that out, will be just to glue them next to each other, in effect. And it's not a brilliant comment, but it will do. So to do this, I'll create another variable. I'll call it combined as well. And what this will do is concatenate the two arrays. And again, you need to look carefully at the arguments. So the first argument, which is slightly harder to read, is a sequence of arrays. It's the same as it was before. So what I need to do is put in square brackets or round brackets to make a list or a tuple of the two arrays. So the first one will be PL 2021, and the second one will be 2020. Then I've got the choice of saying which access I want to join them by. I'll do it in the order I described it. So if I want to put them side by side, I'll choose the first axis. So basically that's going across there and it will stick it to the right of it. And if I run that and show the results, you'll see I get a very short wide array, which I would have thought was almost no use whatsoever. More useful would be to join them going down. So by the uh, first axis. So in this case, I'll put one underneath the other. And if I do that, I'll get something far more useful. Although it still wouldn't allow me to distinguish between the two different tables easily. I'd have to have another column perhaps added to this to, to make that work. So those are the two ways of joining arrays together. So there's a number of things you can do with arrays which don't merit a section of this tutorial on their own. And that's what we're going to cover now. We're going to filter some arrays, transpose them, flatten or ravel them change some values, reshape and resize them to change the appearance of the array, and clip them. So let's start with filtering. What we're going to do is to show just the elements more than, let's say, uh, 80. There won't be many of them. So to do this, you can build up an array of true-false values uh, by creating a new array. Let's call it um, tests. And I can just say with a Premier League table, is greater than 80. What I'll do is print that out just to show you what it looks like. If I run that, you'll see it gives me loads and loads of falses. There's a couple of trues. There's one there and there's one there. And they correspond to 83 and 86. Having set that up, what I can then do is use that to filter my array. So I'll call this a filtered table and set this equal to the Premier League table. And then in square brackets, just like we did with sorting when we provide a list of indices, here we're just going to provide a list of true-false values. And providing this is the same shape, it will work. So now if I print out the filtered table, what I should see is it collapses it, and I just get two single values. Obviously, it can't retain the same shape because it's lost so many values. So that's filtering. There's quite a lot more to it than that, but that will suit most, people need, most people's needs. Transposing is a process of swapping rows and columns. And a common thing to do when you're working with matrices. So what I'll do is create a transpose table. And there's actually two different ways of doing this, would you believe? It's such an important thing to do for arrays. You can either take the Premier League table and apply what is surely the world's shortest method, the T method. And then what I'll do is print out the result. And what that will do is take the original array and transpose it. 
Getting these lines out. The other thing I could have done is I could have created a variable and I could have applied the transpose method to the table and could have printed that out instead. We'll do exactly the same thing. Why would you use one, not the other? In most cases, there seems to be a tiny bit of difference when there's two similar methods, and we'll come to some of those in a short while. But for this, I just cannot see the difference, so whichever you prefer. So that's transposing. What we're going to do now is look at flattening or raveling an array, and what that basically means is collapsing it. And again, there's two different ways to do the same thing. So let's flatten first, and then we'll ravel. How does that sound? So to flatten a, an array, uh, what we'll do is create a new book of flat array. And what we'll do is take the Premier League table and we'll flatten it. And when you do that and type in open brackets, you can see it takes one optional argument, which is the order you're going to use. By default, it will basically go across the columns and then down the rows in to create a sensible logical order. But you can, if you like, go the other way. Uh, and to do that, you would use Fortran style order and pass in F as an argument. And there's a few other orders you can use as well. I think most people probably won't particularly care what order their flattened data comes out in. So if I now print that out, you will see that I get a single dimension array containing all the numbers in my original array, no matter how many dimensions that had in originally. So that's flattening. Let's ravel. So to ravel it, let's create a variable called raveled array. And what we'll do is take the MP module and use its ravel method and take as an argument the Premier League table. And again, I've got a second argument which I could use to specify how I, the order in which I want to do this in. And what I could then do is print out the raveled array. Yes, is when I run this, I'm going to get exactly the same thing. So why are there two ways to do something which isn't particularly useful in the first place? Um, the answer is the subtle difference between them you can see from the help. What the flatten does is returns a copy of the array collapsed into one dimension. And what the ravel does is returns a contiguous array. And it says a copy is made only if needed. So because of this, the ravel will probably work slightly quicker. But as soon as you come to do something like print out the array, it's going to have to take a copy of it anyway. So my personal advice would be to use flatten because I think the syntax is easier and it's certainly easier to remember what the word means. So that's um, flattening. Let's do some editing. So what we're going to do is change one of these numbers. In fact, let's be specific. Let's change that number 11. And what we're going to do is double it to 22. So that's in the second row, third column, if you remember that. And to do this is very simple, although it's not something you would often need to do, I would have thought, having created an array. So I could take my Premier League table. I'll just comment out these lines of code just in case they interfere. And what I can do then is specify for the first axis, I want to go to row number two. For the second axis, I want to go to column number three. I hope I remembered it that it's right. And I want to set that to be 22. And that's how you can change the value. So if I then print that out, what you should see is I get exactly the same thing, apart from one value, 22 there. You can also loop over rows and columns changing values like that. But again, I can't see why you'd ever particularly want to do that. And this tutorial has to end somewhere. So that's editing. Going back up to my list, we're going to reshape and resize now. So to do this, again, two very similar ways to do exactly the same thing. Let's do reshaping first. And what we'll do is work with a subset of my premise table. And the reason I want to do that is because as things stand, it's seven by five or five by seven rather. So it's 35 elements and that only sub or factorizes in one way. So what I'm going to do is just strip out, if I may, the first column using some slicing and we'll work with a five by six array, which will be easier to um, factorize in different ways. So I'll create a variable called subtable and I'll set that to be my Premier League table. 
And what I'll do is keep all of the rows, but lose the first column. Uh, always a good idea just to print that out, just to check it's working. And it seems to have given me what I was after. I've got a five by six array. So what I can now do is to try reshaping that. So I'll create a variable which I'll call reshaped table. And what I'll do is take the subtable I've just created and apply the reshape method to it. And this takes an argument, which is the shape I want it to be. And strictly speaking, a shape is a tuple, so I need to include that in a pair of brackets too, although it does seem to work without it. So it was five by six, I'm gonna make it four by eight. Now you don't have to be a genius in maths to realize five by six is 30 and four by eight is 32. So what's it going to do with the fact that the amount of elements aren't the same? And the answer is crash. And it would have been the same if I tried to put too small a number in. So if I change that to four by four, it would still crash. So when you're using reshape, you have to keep the same size, even though you can change the dimensions. So for example, I've got to get to 30, so I could do um, three by two by five. And providing that multiplies to get the same number, I'll get a result. So reshaping can use any dimensions. Let's do one more quick example. Let's do 30, and that will give me a single dimension array. So reshaping, you have to keep the same size, but you can still change the shape. Perhaps that's why they called it reshape. Resizing is more forgiving. What we'll do is resize this. And to do that, I'll create a variable called resized table. And I'll set this to be mp.resize. And you can see it's taking two arguments. The first is the array I'm resizing, which is a subtable. And the second is a new shape I want to use. And this time I definitely do need the round brackets. And what I'll do is say I want it to be four by eight. So that's what I tried to do last time. It didn't work for reshaping, but for resizing, I think it will work. If I try running that now, you'll see I get the same array. And it was 30 elements, five by six. It's now four by eight, which is 32. And so what it's doing is actually repeating two elements at the end. The reason I was hesitant there is I was actually expecting to see zeros in there. And under some circumstances, I think resize does do that. I could also uh, put, I put two large numbers there. Let's try two small. So I'm going to lose 14 elements now because I've only got 16 available to me. If I run that, you can see it just chops it off. So although resizing is more forgiving, I wonder whether you would use it that often in practice. And finally, let's do some clipping. So what I'll do is go back to my original Premier League table and what I want to do is impose a maximum and a minimum. So what I'm going to do is, if anything is under 10, I'm going to show it as 10. And if anything is under over 50, I'll show that as 50. So this will look radically different after doing this. And it's called clipping. So to do this, I can create a new table. And I can set it to be the original Premier League table. And I can clip it. And you can see there that you can specify a minimum and maximum. These can be erased so they can, you can be more flexible than just imposing a single minimum and a single maximum, but I'm just going to go for a simple version. So the minimum I said was 10, the maximum I think I said was 50, apologies, I've just changed the rules. And if I now try printing out the new table, you'll see that everything is at least 10 and at most 50. Now, I've shown a whole load of different things there. As you may gather from some of the methods you can see in the IntelliSense, there's a huge amount more you can do with arrays besides. But what I've tried to do is show you the things you'll use most often. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, quite long tutorial on NumPy. Uh, next up in the series is Pandas.